Hello everyone and thank you for choosing NGIB Preparation. Today we're going to be starting Cell Biology, covering all the syllabus points under 1.1, Introduction to Cell Theory, and 1.2, The Ultra Structure of Cells. In this video, you'll learn everything that you need to know to get 7 under these topics. But what is cell theory? Well, cell theory can be described as composed of three main rules, namely that all living organisms are composed of cells, cells are the smallest unit of life, and that all cells come from pre-existing cells. Now the IB syllabus point relating to this is just that all living organisms are composed of cells. But the syllabus also requires you to know exceptions to the cell theory, one of them being skeletal muscle. Now the reason skeletal muscle is considered an exception is because it's made of, of really large muscle fibers, and these cells are actually much larger than our conventional understanding of cells and have hundreds of nuclei even though they're enclosed in a single plasma membrane. Another exception could be giant alga because this is a large organism but contains only a single cell and a single nucleus. This challenges the idea that complex or large organisms have to be formed by more than one cell. The last exception is aseptite fungi, which indicates that cell is not only one unit, as again has many nuclei, with undivided structures called hyphae, and the cytoplasm is continuous and there's no end wall or membrane. So again, this contradicts our usual idea of what a cell looks like. Now the next syllabus point requires you to understand that a cell governs an entire organism and the cell must therefore perform all the functions of life. What are the functions of life? Well, you can remember it as Mr. Shen. For an organism to be considered living, it has to first have a metabolism, meaning a way to transfer nutrition into energy. It must have a way of reproducing itself, either asexually or sexually. It has to have some sort of sensitivity or response, meaning that if I were to shine light on a certain organism, it would change directions or react in some way. They also must perform homeosiestis, meaning that they keep their internal conditions more or less the same, such as temperature or water content. Excretion means that they must have a way to dispose of their waste. Nutrition means that they must have a way to, again, gather energy and growth means that living things can either move or change shape or size over time. Lopez also asks that you name two examples of unicellular organisms and kind of highlight how they meet this Mr. Shen criteria. So the first we're going to look at is paramecium, this unicellular organism that lives in ponds. So we would draw paramecium as such where there's food in the vesicles, which we will see will enter through endocytosis. We have the nucleus where the DNA is held. Right, so if we were to highlight all the functions of the paramecium, we would start with metabolism. The paramecium basically produces enzymes to catalyze different reactions and to turn nutrition into energy. It reproduces either through mitosis or meiosis. In terms of sensitivity or response, it moves directions when touched. As for homeostasis, we saw that the paramecium has a contractile vacuole, which it actually uses to expel excess water. It excretes its waste, which is CO2 from respiration, through diffusion as it leaves the cell. It gains nu nutrition from ingesting smaller organisms, so endocytosis, and this was shown in the food in the vesicles within the paramecium, and it grows through accumulating dry mass from the ingestion of smaller organisms. Right, so we have a first example of a unicellular organism. The second one that we can do is the Chlamydominus. As you can see visually, the Chlamydominus is different from the paramecium as it has a chloroplast, meaning that it probably performs photosynthesis, it has an eye spot, the flagellum, also has a nucleus and a cell wall instead of a plasma membrane. So if we compare how the Chlamydominus performs its life functions to the paramecium, we'll see that they both have the same type of metabolism, they both produce enzymes, they both reproduce the same way through mitosis or meiosis. Their sensitivity or response is different because the Chlamydominus is actually able to sense light through the eye spot. So we can see that the main difference between these two organisms is the paramecium because it uses photosynthesis as its form of nutrition, even if the excretion is done through diffusion, it is O2 from photosynthesis rather than from respiration. The sensitivity is also different, like we said before. Growth is different because it absorbs minerals and accumulates mass through photosynthesis. And again, the main difference is the, um, the fact that the paramecium has a chloroplast and therefore is able to conduct photosynthesis. If you remember, chloroplast is often found in plant cells. The next syllabus point we're going to be covering is why surface area to volume ratio is so important in cells. Well, the plasma membrane is responsible for the import and export of cell materials and therefore the rate of metabolic reactions. We say that the larger the surface area to volume ratio, the more efficient because for every unit of volume that requires nutrients and waste, there is more membrane. So the diffusion pathways are therefore shorter and molecules have to travel less, so less time and less energy is spent. But if the ratio is too large, the rate of metabolic reactions and of entry and exit of materials is too large and therefore the cell might lose heat. In fact, even some desert plants might minimize surface area to volume ratio to conserve water. The way that 
surface to volume ratio is usually maximized is through cell division because two small cells is better than just one big cell in terms of the rate of metabolic reaction. A good way to remember this by is if metabolic rate and increase in volume is greater than the rate of exchange of waste and nutrients, then the cell will die and it must divide for a viable surface area to volume ratio. The next syllabus point relates to emergent property. So emergent property just means that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. The reason for this is, if you think about it, the summation of our, all our cells is not the same as us as beings, and this is because each cell in the human body has a distinct function that, when working together, allows humans to live. So really, this relates to cell differentiation or committed cells, meaning that some genes are expressed in some cells but not in others, so each cell is specialized to perform its particular function. So, for instance, hemoglobin, which is necessary for maintaining oxygen in the red blood cells, is expressed only in certain types of cells. And there are actually over 220 distinct cell types in humans. A group of specialized cells can also be considered specialized tissue. The only exception to this differentiation of cells is cells that are needed in the pathway of development. So it's necessary for these cells to be undifferentiated or uncommitted because they don't yet know their functions. So for instance, embryonic cells before birth or in the bone marrow, in the liver or in the skin. And actually in the skin, this is because we need to be able to continuously replicate skin. So it is in our best interest that these cells be undifferentiated. The next syllabus point asks you to look at the medical uses of using stem cells for medical purposes. So one way that you can use undifferentiated cells to treat a disease would be in the case of Stargardt's disease. This is a recessive gene mutation that usually happens in children between 6 and 12 years of age, which causes the membrane protein for active transport in retina cells, the cells that allow us to turn light into vision, to fail, and this results in a loss of vision. So in 2010, a woman was injected with about 50,000 stem cells from the embryo, so embryonic stem cells, undifferentiated cells, and then these cells attached to her retina and then differentiated to perform the functions that would occur in the retina, and she actually saw an improvement in sight. So this would be the first example. The second example is probably more commonly known, leukemia, which happens when too many white blood cells are produced in the bone marrow and count rises up to 20,000 millimeters cubed above normal. So to treat this, a large needle is used to extract fluid from the pelvis bone marrow and then to extract stem cells. Then chemotherapy is used to kill all the patient's cancer cells and then these stem cells are re-injected into the bone marrow and hopefully this produces normal counts of red and white blood cells. You also have to be familiar with the ethical implications of using stem cells for medical purposes. Some of the objections that people bring up is that while adults can give consent, newborns can't, so the use of embryonic stem cells from therefore are problematic. The problem is, is that if a embryo is specially created for the purpose of stem cell protection, it does have unlimited power, but there is a higher risk of a tumor happening when the stem cells are used. There's also the argument that the embryo is a human life, even though they lack a nervous system, so they feel no pain, they have no essential features, and no real properties of human life. It's also worth noting that many embryos produced from in vitro fertilization are never implanted, so it might be best to, instead of kill them, to use their stem cells. You also need to know the formula for finding magnification in an image. It can be given by magnification is equal to image size over actual size. Obviously, you can rearrange the formula however you need to. So for instance, if you need to calculate actual size, then it's actual size equals image size over M. When we start talking about the ultrastructure of cells as well, you need to know that electron microscopes have a much shorter wavelength than light microscopes, so they're better, um, so they have better resolution. So when we talk about Finding the ultrastructure of cells, we can only really do that through electron microscopes. You also need to be aware of the difference between prokaryote cells and eukaryote cells. So prokaryote cells means before the nucleus, they have no nucleus, nor do they have compartmentalization. And a eukaryote does have a nucleus. Okay, so let's draw a prokaryote E. coli cell. So as you can see, it has no compartmentalization. It has a cell wall and a plasma membrane, which as we said before, regulates the entry and exit of materials from the cell. It also has ribosomes, which are used to synthesize proteins. Instead of a nucleus, it has a nucleoid, which contains a single DNA strand. It also has flagella, which aids it for movement. Pili is for cell adhesion. And it divides by binary fusion, meaning that the chromosomes replicate, then move to opposite sides. The plasma membrane is pinched inwards, and the cell separates. 
more on cell replication later. As for eukaryotes, they do contain a nucleus and they do have compartmentalization, meaning that different areas of the cell have specific pH to ensure op optimal metabolic efficiency. They also digest very strong enzymes that could digest the, the cell itself in lysosomes. So as you can see, I've divided the cell into blue and green because the blue side is a plant cell, which is different from the green side, which is an animal cell. The main differences between them is that while an animal cell has a mitochondria for energy, the plant cell has a chloroplast, which, is, which it uses for photosynthesis. The mitochondria is responsible for ATP production, for energy production, and is the powerhouse of the cell. Another key difference is that animal cells have ADS ribosomes, meaning bigger ribosomes than plant cells, which only have 70S ribosomes. They both have rough endoplastic reticulum, or rough ER, which synthesizes proteins and then is transported by the vesicles to the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus is, if you want to think of it like a post office, it gives vesicles a direction to go within the cell. A vesicle is just a transport of materials within the cell. So highlighted above are the key differences between an animal and a plant cell. Thank you so much for watching, hope this was helpful, and please leave any comments if you'd like any more in-depth explanations or help on any other IB biology topic 